Waiting for a kingdom come, but baby, I'm just so tired. All I want is to be alone. You promise me you'll never leave me alone. The heart is heavy and the sky gets lost. I keep thinking you'll be better off without me. Playing machine, staring at the same four walls. Staring at the same four 
bag of bones I try with all my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A bag of bones Just when I ran out of road I met a man But to believe my doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So long to my old friends Burden and bitterness You can just keep it moving, yeah You ain't welcome here From now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing a heart I thank the Savior, I thank God Sing hell lost another one
Faithful to you, sing this out. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my All right, 
Hello and salutations. That's from uh, uh, Charlotte's Web? Yes. I know my E.B. White. Come on. <laughs> As Tyler Kaycock and Tyler Kaycock and his Spider-Man walks away. We're just talking about spiders, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler KK. Okay, you guys, tonight it is time for our last and final artist interview. And I got to tell you, this is the most unique one we've ever done at Creative Arts Academy, and I am here for this energy. You guys ready? Yes. I thought you were the only it. one for a minute. Do what? I thought you were the only one who was here for this energy. I know. Okay. I mean, at least the three of us are. Yeah. Anyway. Would you guys introduce yourselves? Sure. We'd love both to. of you. Love to. Hey, uh, my name's Nathan, Nathan Morris. Hey, guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a father, father of two. My two kids are over there. The yes. Hey, Look at those curls, yep. baby. Let's yep. go. Yep. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a youth minister here in town at a local church uh, called Heights. Uh, shout out. <laughs> Um, yeah, some of you guys are in the room, uh, and we love board games. We're, uh, that's, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, oh. just our, our love for board games. Hi, I'm Chelsea Bennett. I am from Web City. Any Web City? Yes, Woo. let's go. Only one? What? Okay. Well, um, I uh, do graphic design and marketing at um, a local firm here, and I do high school ministry at uh, College Heights, and I also love board games. And I might also add the second and cooler of the Bennett's on this stage this week. Am, yeah. Are we right about that? Okay. Take that, sir. Go roast your coffee beans. Okay. It's true. It's true. Um, it is true. <laughs> so legitimately, tonight we're talking about board games. This is so fun for me. Who loves board games? Hey. Yes. More One On the count of three, tell me your favorite board game and I'll hear them all. One, two, three. I heard a risk. I did hear a risk. A lot of monopolies. Monop did you catch a monopoly, Chelsea? No Chelsea, fear. you're not on board with monopoly? Hey. Why not? We don't set up barriers. We bring them down, all right? <laughs> okay, would you guys tell me, like, before we talk about your board games, like, that we're here to talk about, would you each tell me, like, maybe your favorite board game, how you got into loving board games? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, so, so my uh, fascination with board games kind of came... Uh, early in me and Ashley's marriage. Um, have you, has anybody ever played Munchkin before? Has anybody Yay! played that game? Okay, I, love, I loved it. It got me into the hobby. Hate it now. Played it way too many times. But uh, we just kept buying different versions of Munchkin. There's like a hundred. They're all the same game, but they're, yeah. they're just different versions of them. They're just then, trying to get your money, Nathan, they, let's be honest. Hey, honestly, they did it. And then we realized, oh, there's other stuff out here that's not Munchkin. Uh, and that's kind of that's kind of where our the inception of the love of board games started. Uh, it was a tale as old as time between me and my wife. It was beautiful. Wait, what movie is that? That's another movie. That is also Charlotte's Web. Just kidding. It tale of old. It is tale as old as time. Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Nice. Well, Chelsea. Um, so my husband, he's also the bass player for Me Like Bees. Yeah! So, um, <laughs> but still the second coolest Bennett second on the coolest stage. Bennett. Yes. Thank you. Um, um, so he is uh, best friends with Nathan here, and he started bringing me over to their house to play board games every Sunday night for years, and that's kind of how I got into the hobby. Um, and my favorite board game is probably Space Base. Space Base. Nice. Oh, my man knows it. <laughs> He's cool. This He's is a cool all guy. in. <laughs> well, then you, sir, are here for this energy. I love it. So you guys. We're here to talk about the Cardboard Cafe. Would you tell us what that is? So the Cardboard Cafe is a, um, I don't know if you've been to any uh, board game cafes, but it, uh, it's pretty much just a place, almost like a library of board games that uh, you can play, pick from. We have 350 board games. <laughs> 350? Um, yes. Can you name them all, Chelsea? No. Okay. Um, Yes, we might even have more than that. We can't bring them all all the time. But um, so we're trying. We tried to st trying to start that up um, here in Joplin. There's one in Kansas City and Branson and Tulsa, and you can come play games. You can eat and drink and play board games for hours, and uh, not just one. You can choose from all 350. You got time. I've got time. I don't know if I got 350 time. So is ca cardboard cafe 
um, like a fixed location? Is it a traveling yeah. exhibit? That's, that's a good question. So we, we do a pop-up board game cafe. Um, right now, we, we usually are based in, at Joplin Greenhouse, which is a local coffee shop. Um, yeah, actually, Jake, Jake uh, roasts the beans there, too. Um, but we, we started out I at... Prom- I told you, I wasn't joking about roasting beans. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we actually started out at Bearded Lady, which is a small coffee shop here in town. We kind of outgrew that. Um, and so now we kind of do it where, wherever. We've done it at churches. We've done it at colleges. Um, and, and we do it at, at Joplin Greenhouse, too. So just pop up. So fun. Yeah. So do you, do you just show up? Do you pay an entry fee? Is there a, a, an annual pass? How, how do yeah, you get, yeah. take part in this? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, uh, typically we do have, we, we, uh, you pay an entry fee when you come in, uh, depending on if we do it for a school. Actually, we've done, we've done one here at Ozark before. Um, and, and usually if, if a school or, or something puts it on, it's just like whoever goes to that school gets to come. But um, one of the things that we like doing, um, we don't just like set up the games. We, we kind of like pride ourselves on knowing uh Almost all of them. If you guys find one that we don't know, I'm sorry, but we know most of them. Uh, and we, we can, I mean, I think the, the hardest part about learning a new board game is just like learning it, right? Just setting it up and trying to figure out all the nuances to it. Um, so we, we know enough about every board game that we could take that step out of it completely. So we can teach you the board games. And board games, just because they're board games, are awesome. But, but why do you guys think that board games specifically are important? Yeah. Um, you, you mind if you mind if I take this one? Okay. Um, so I think that there's I think there's there's some kind of like tactile connection that that happens specifically over something like an analog thing like a board game um, that you really can't get through any other mediums. Actually, Jake and I we just did a TED talk about board games uh, a few weeks ago, and and that's like we that's all that this that's all it was about. We were just talking about the specific connection point that can come. There, there's something about just like being able to like pit your mind against the mind of somebody else's um, while you're like moving the pieces around. There's some kind of connection that comes from there that just feels stronger than a lot of other things. I would say the closest thing I could liken it to is if you've ever played like Smash Bros or Mario Kart like on the same couch, like it's sort of like that. You can't really beat that, right? And, and, and in this digital age that we live in, like the opportunity to actually have physical human connection, it, it just can't be matched. We've been saying something in literally every artist interview this week. These guys will know how to finish it. One of the greatest gifts that God has given us is? Bingo. So, like, what, what do board games, Chelsea, offer in that realm of community that can, as we look at the Christian side of how we think about this, what, what does that level of community f- done over a board game offer to us? I think it's a reason to come together. Um, it's a reason, I mean, we've, we've helped, you know, bring people together that were alone all together to play one board game together that had no idea who the other person is wow. and, you know, make friendships. And one of the things I like about this too is that, you know, there's not a lot to do around Joplin yeah. and except, you know, I don't, I don't want to go out to bars and I don't, you know, don't want to do those things. I think that Board games is something fun, and it's safe, and it's, it's just a great way to connect with people. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, th- I think what you were talking about, like, the, the, the board games are really just kind of like the grease in the wheels or sort of like the catalyst for, for the community. And I think, like, the, the foundation of the church is, this, is community, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's one way to, to, get, to get people together in that sense. But I think what's cool about board games is that it kind of removes some of, like, the awkward pretense um, I mean, automatically, you know the rules whenever you sit down and something's been explained to you. So you don't have to worry about, like, how's the weather outside? It's like, I'm going to crush you right now, you know? <laughs> and I'll, what's cool about this is that board games can both be the end, like, we're here to play board games, but also the means to the end of the community. And I, I love that dual nature of it. Ha, I'm curious, have either of you guys ever created a board game yourself? Uh, listen, there have been, there have been quite a few attempts. Uh, what you'll find out is we all kind of bring something to the team. I don't bring like the finish, you know what I mean? Like the tenacity to push through. I'm like, what if we tried this? And then I get bored of it really quick. Jake uh, and Ash are much more tenacious than I do, than I am. Um, so I think, I think it's definitely in the cards, pun intended, you know what I'm talking about, uh, at some point. Uh, but yeah, right now we've just got a pile of Good ideas. <laughs> that we've got to see across the finish line, not from idea yeah. man right here. Sure. I'll I love that. It. Now, one of the things that's true is people have like 
sometimes preconceived notions about board games. Maybe it's like, you know, they're boring or they take too long or things like that. What, what would you say to somebody that's bringing that energy, since we're going to keep using that phrase, uh, to, that has those preconceived notions yeah. to get rid of that? Honestly, like, I mean, I would say that's completely valid for real. Like, I think there have been a whole lot of stinkers in the board game space, so we got a lot of ground to make up. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, it's something that we've kind of talked about a lot, that the board game scene has kind of, like, grown a lot in the last, I mean, for sure, since you guys have, have been around, it's been, it's just been growing. Um, so I would say, like, even if you have, like, sort of a poor experience with board games uh, that you remember, uh, the scene has, like, evolved enough that you probably can come back and there's something that's totally there, there for you, you know? And cooperative games. Those are real now. You guys know about this? You guys know about cooperative games? They're real. Yeah, he knows. Great. All right. <laughs> yes. I, I don't like to cooperate, though, so I'm out on that. I'm just kidding. Um, okay, if you guys were talking to the high school versions of yourself and, like, hey, one day you're going to start this thing where you play board games and invite everyone. Like, what, what would you say to that version of yourself about, like, man, thinking about some of the fun, creative stuff that's ahead in your future? I would just... Um, I think 16-year-old me would be surprised how big the world is. Mm -hmm. Just in the fact that there's more than just this, my little circle, my little world where, you know, I wanted to be a videographer, I wanted to be a graphic designer, I wanted to be an actor, I wanted to do, you know, and, and so it just, you can really do anything. And, and I didn't think I'd go into board games, but um, you, just, you just find a community, you find so many different communities. I mean, I'm six years younger than these guys. You just find a, a, you know, a, a different group and you find new interests and you aren't just stuck in that one choice that you make when you're forced to try and make a decision when you're 18 going into college. You can, you can keep going and keep doing more and more things. Yeah. That's awesome, Chelsea. I love it. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I would say, like, uh, like I said before, I'm not like a, I'm not like the finisher guy. I don't know if there's anybody out there that feels similarly. Like, man, I got a lot of good ideas. Crossing the finish line is really hard. Um, I would say, like, find people who don't know like how to stay down. You know, uh, I, I feel like Jake and Chels and Ash are those people for me. Um, I mean, honestly, like I've, I've learned a lot from the whole team on just uh, this idea that um, I've got deficits, I've got strengths, and I've got weaknesses, um, and finding a community that kind of like evens those out or brings my weaknesses, kind of fills in my weaknesses a little bit so that we can do something like this, um, I would say just the community uh, aspect of that uh, to, to pursue something and not just like stay down whenever you feel defeated. Uh, that's, that's been really big for me. And that's something that I can't do by myself, I would say. So yeah, that's, that's what I tell. That's so cool. Last question for you guys. Like I said, this is by far the most unique artist interview we've done. And I'm all, I, I love that. And so, um, as, as these guys think about like, I think we so often think about creative endeavors and, and maybe kind of as Chelsea, you just said that maybe our idea or vision of what that is is small. How can these guys dream of creating something that they might not even know is possible? Like, uh, like I, I didn't know I could create a place where we just go hang out and play board games, whether it's starting something like this or something outside the realm of what they know right now. How, how would you encourage them to attack that? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I would, um, I think, I think the answer to my last one is similar to this one. I would say find people that, that can kind of make sure that the, that the vision gets pushed along a little bit, even if, if you're not really that person. Um, I'd also say that, um, I would, I would say a lot of you guys are probably here because you have a very specific interest or a very specific set of skills that you would, you'd want to, you'd want to hone. And I think that's really important. Um, one of the, one of the most important things that my mentor told me is that a lot of the time when we think about being creative, we actually are, are not broad enough with what creation means. Um, we're, we're all called to do just what the father did, which is to create, to be creative entities. Um, so I would say, uh, like, definitely hone the skills, whether you're writing, whether you're doing songwriting, whether you're doing lights, hone the skills that you're working on right now. Um, I would also say, like, don't necessarily, like, let that be the cap, like, this is all that I'm ever going to do. Um, I, th I think that creativity 
is a lot broader than that. And actually, whenever you kind of start opening your mind to those kind of possibilities, ideas like this don't seem that wild after that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, you can do it all. Like, you don't have to just stick to one thing and decide that's, I mean, I went to school, to college for mass communications, broadcasting, ew. Um, and I, I, do, I do graphic design, I still do theater, I embroider, I, I do a cardboard cafe, uh, the board game cafe. I mean, you can, you're not stuck in the one choice that you have to make. And I also just find people that encourage that. Don't find people that are like, you want to do the, you want to do a board game cafe and drop one? You want to do theater? You want to do act? Like, you can't do that as a career. Like, you can. You can do things. You can do things that you love, and you can do all of it. That's good. And I'm so grateful to you guys for not only that vision, but doing it within the realm of we do this not to just do it because it's fun, but so that we can continue to grow uh, God's love throughout these communities. And man, that is so neat and so special. So thank you guys for leaning into that. Thank you for the example that that sets yeah. for all of us. So how, how can these guys connect with you later on? Yeah. Uh, we got Facebook and Instagram and not TikTok yet, but it's uh, Cardboard Cafe Joplin. And uh, we do events. We try to do events every few, every couple months. Um, our next event is July 29th. At, um, possibly. Next event is tonight, actually. Yeah, it is. It's tonight. Uh, in, upstairs in the cafe. I think that's what you call it. And uh, yeah, so our next event is tonight. But then our next, next event is July 29th at um, Joplin Greenhouse. It's five bucks to get in. You have four hours to play a raffle to win a board game. Um, and it's, it's a good time. I love that. So you guys are going to get to participate in Cardboard Cafe tonight. That's so fun. I'm so excited for that. Would you guys help me thank Nathan and Chelsea for joining us up here on stage tonight? That's awesome. Thank you, guys. I'll, I'll take care of it. You guys just take the chairs. Um, you guys, what's fun is, as Nathan said, he works at College Heights Christian Church, which is just a couple minutes away here in town. Uh, one of my colleagues, one of my friends here at Ozark Christian College is a man named Randy Garris, who was the senior minister at that church for a minute. No, for literally decades of his life. He and his wife, Julie, the model of consistency and long-term ministry that is, is something we can and should all aspire to do in the work that God has called us to. Uh, if you ask any Ozark student around here, like, man, if life's hitting you, if life's hard and struggling, what do you need to do? You need to go have a conversation with Randy or Julie. They are people who love dearly, who are pastorally invested here on the life of our campus, and people who have seen it all, been through it all, and done it all. There is, there is nothing in life that you could throw at Randy that would shock or surprise him because of his literal decades of ministry. I count it a true joy and honor to call this man a brother and a co-worker in this kingdom work that we do man, uh, is, is so deeply invested in God's word and is going to bring it to life for you tonight. So we're going to see our, our video and Randy's going to come and share from God's word with us tonight. Well, there's nothing like being the old guy on, on the uh, camp. I tried to leave my, my walker over there so you wouldn't see it. And I probably am the old guy in the room. And being the old guy in the room, I feel a particular responsibility. And that responsibility is not to prattle on like a, an old guy might, but to stand here as a guy who's loved Jesus my whole life and say he's changed everything for me. My father's family was rougher than a cob. My father's family had enough alcoholics and drug addicts, and my father's family had enough brokenness that by rights I know where I should be in my life. Christ made the difference. I grew up in a school that had 
high STEM value. We were one of the best in science and technology. And I remember as a junior high kid, early high school kid, trying to decide what am I going to do with my life? I remember riding on, on the bus, and I, I, I'm not going to call him by his right name, but uh, Charles. And here I rode the bus. We lived out in the boonies, and I remember riding to the bus an hour, an hour and 15 minutes in the morning. And I remember this guy saying over and over again, you guys just follow a superstitious nonsense. Man, you, 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 you churchy people, you just have, and, and, and this guy, he, he threw all kinds of ideas at me, and I'm a high school se- a freshman, sophomore, and I remember reading Wagner and, 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 and Voltaire. I, I, I remember reading Nietzsche because I didn't want to be the idiot who just followed along with whatever your songs you sing and dance on the stage, and you have this Bible, and... But the more I studied it, the more I looked at it, and the more I actually began to look at Jesus. I'm a 69-year-old man who will tell you, Christ changed my life, and Charles shot himself later. I don't want to waste my 25 minutes with you tonight. I want you to know Jesus. And we're not selling snake oil out of the back of a car. I'm telling you what's over the road and down the path you haven't had a chance to see yet. And I'm telling you, Christ is everything. Where we'll begin tonight is just simply I want to start with the core truth. It comes from John. You heard about him this morning. I don't know myself, obviously. I don't have any insight more than anybody else does on this one. But I'm going to guess John was closer to your age than even was 20 when he first followed in Jesus. I'm going to guess he was closer to 15 than he was 20. So some of you in this room that are 16 or 17 years old, that's my, that's my suspicion probably for how old John was. And John, when he writes his memoir, he writes very little about himself. But he sets Jesus as high as you can possibly reach. John is setting Christ as high. And he writes his five book of memoirs. But I think the punchiest one, and the place where it starts... It's where we need to start tonight. I know that if you're speaking to high school kids, you're supposed to to do something really clever to start with. Can can I just simply tell you, we're going to start with the scripture. I'm going to build from that. I want to read with you, and I want you to hear. I don't want you to hear with your regular ears where you just kind of one thing comes in and out the other. I don't want you to hear it like you do other stuff. I, I, I want you to hear it for what it really is. Just for the simple sacredness of it. We're standing on holy ground. Would you stand while I read a portion of John chapter 1? The scriptures were written to be heard. Paul tells Timothy to give attention to the public reading of the word. I deliberately am not putting it on the screen. I just want you to hear it. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. And he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of a natural descent, nor of a human decision, or a father or a husband's will, but born of God. And the word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who has come from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then drop down to verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known. You may be seated. John drops a bomb when he starts his book. His memoir is, I want you to know about Jesus, and he says 12 things about Jesus as I would record them. I, I, it's what you just heard, but I'm going to run through them very quickly. Here's the 12th thing that he says. 
He will say that Jesus always existed. Yes, he came in the flesh at a certain date at a certain time, but he has always been here. And, and you maybe have already heard in the past, but why did John call him the Word? The reason he called him the Word is because John is trying to pull together two audiences. The Greek audience and the Roman audience, they knew their, their flimsy little gods hadn't made the world. They were more pretend. They knew that. But they didn't know who made the world. They didn't know what the sinner was. And they said, there's a mind or a reason, a word back behind there somewhere that made it. And he takes the word logos, their word they used. And he said, would you like to know who the logos is? He has a name. His name is Jesus. And the Jews had always said, well, God gets the final word. We listen to the word of God. And he said, if you listen to the word of God, then the word of God has a name. His name is Jesus. And that's why he begins, in the beginning was the word. And he pulls both audiences together. The second thing that he will say is that this Jesus was with God from the very beginning. He wasn't created. He didn't show up late to the party. The third thing he will say is he is God. The fourth thing he will say is he's the creator of all things. The fifth thing he will say that is that he is the life and the light of all mankind. I know you're trying to figure life out, but John, who lives as an old man himself and writes this, said you will be like a fish out of water if you do not know who Jesus is. He is the center. Without him, there is no life, there is no light. He will say the sixth thing that the light enter the darkness of this world and the darkness cannot and will not overcome it. The seventh thing he said is that the creator of the world came into his own. He came to his own world and he came to his own people, but they did not receive him. The eighth thing he says, but to all who do receive him, he gives the right to become children of God. The ninth thing he will say is God put on flesh and lived right here among us. The tenth thing he will say is we saw with our own eyes the glory of God. The eleventh thing he will say, and we saw that this Jesus is full of grace and truth. And the twelfth thing he will say is no one has ever seen the heavenly father but Jesus who is the son or the essence of God. He has made him known to all of us. I'm confident that you couldn't have lived 20 minutes in this world, certainly not as a believer, a Christ follower, that somebody didn't say, you're making too much of Jesus. You guys are making too much of Jesus. The New Yorker magazine, uh, I saw it last December, uh, it had a little article, the most significant event, it said, in the history of, the, of, of life on this earth was the day the asteroid hit the earth. John would have said, you've got to be kidding me. The most significant event on the history of this, of this earth is when the a asteroid hit the earth. John would say, no, no, no. The most significant day in the life of this earth was the day that Jesus put on flesh and stepped into this world. It was the day that life and light came to you and me. Somebody would say that's a pretty strong claim. Why would you say that? <laughs> There's a lot of reasons I would say that. I want to start with one of the most basic and tender ones. I realize I'm about to ask you a set of questions that are the stupidest questions you've been asked all day. The first two or three of them, I want you to raise your hand as you answer this. After about the third one, you're going to realize he's asking pretty stupid questions. I don't need to keep raising my hand. But the first three, I want you to. Do you believe that the poor have as much value as the rich? Raise your hand. Do you believe that a woman should be treated and considered every bit as valuable as a man? Do you believe that it's wrong for one human being to own another human being? You don't have to keep raising your hand, but I'm going to keep going with them. Do you believe that children should be allowed to live if they were born and are the wrong gender for what you wanted? Do you believe that children should be allowed to live if they were born at the wrong time? Do you believe that children should be allowed to live if they have a look on their face that you didn't want? Do you believe that children should be allowed to live if they have a disability of some type? 
Do you believe that the disabled have the same dignity and worth as the healthy? Do you believe that orphans matter? Do you believe the sick have the same worth and value as a healthy human being? You need to know that Socrates didn't believe any of those things. Plato didn't believe any of those things. Aristotle didn't believe any of those things. Cicero didn't believe any of those things. The Pharaohs didn't believe those things. The Chinese emperors didn't believe those things. Alexander the Great didn't believe those things. None of the Caesars believed those things. The Germanic tribes did not believe those things. The Franks did not believe those things. And you can go as long as you want until one solitary creature, one human being, stepped into the into this world. The one who stepped in changed the course of everything you know and everything you've lived. If there would be anybody in this room who would say, well, I I don't think I really want to have this Jesus in my life, I would say to you, it's way too late, kid. You already live in the shadow and the influence of Jesus. Everything you know that is good has come because of the influence and the power of this solitary individual we call Jesus. The world Jesus stepped into is a world that was full of slaves, is a world where most every woman was in reality owned by a man. It was a world in which the sick were abandoned, in which orphans were thrown away, in which the poor are only to be exploited, in which enemies were to be hated and killed, and the powerless were simply to be used. That was the world. You ever wonder why you're even at a camp all these years later, and you're talking about Jesus, an obscure guy from an obscure place? How in the world should you even know his name? History should have devoured him. It should have been dust. How in the world did this character called Jesus, and how did his handful of little disciples, how did they turn the world upside down? Truth is, it's pretty simple. The one who stepped into this world, and what he taught, and who he was, and the impact rotated everything. A guy named Rodney Stark. Rodney Stark studied the Roman Empire, and he said, tell me how this Jesus, born of Nazareth, crucified by the Romans, reported to be resurrected, how in the world could he, with his small band of believers, become in 300 years more Christians than there were of the, of the Romans? How, how, did that, how did that occur? His answer is pretty simple. He who is light and life really did come, and here's what happened. I want you to think about the Roman world for a second. I'm going to start with the girls. In the Roman world, for every 1.5, every 1.5 million men, there were only 1 million girls. Why? Because girls don't matter. There's just no way around it. This is not the most politically correct conversation, I promise you. Girls didn't matter. Girls were throwaway. You can find a, 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 a number of letters. Here's, a, here's one we, we, we clearly even have, a, have the full copy of it. It's a Roman soldier who writes back to his wife and says, congratulations on being pregnant. I'm really glad. If it's a son, name him such and such. such. If, 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 if it's a girl, disc, discard her. The actual Greek word they used was expose. Expose her. And so what they did is they had two different ways. One was pretty simple. They put them on a religious platform and you let nature take its course. Even today, you dig anywhere around the world and you go dig somewhere and you find an old city and you say, I wonder what civilization this is from. I wonder where it's from. You just dig until you try to figure out some clue. If you want to know if it's a Roman city or not, it's pretty simple. Dig down to where the sewers are. Because when you dig in the sewers, you're going to be able to find if it's a Roman town or not. Because it's really simple. There's two ways. The way they soldered the pipes together will tell you if it's a Roman sewer. And secondly, does it have children's bones? Because we throw the girls in the sewer. 
We have the city of Delphi. It's a Roman city that had 600 families in it. We know the exact census of all 600. We, every man, woman, child, and cocker spaniel. We, 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 we know them all in Delphi. 600 families. Six families are all that had more than one girl. The rest of them, when the second girl is born, we don't need her, discard her. I'm being pretty raw. How many of you in this room are the second daughter in a family? You would not have lived in that world. Why? Because the darkness and the brokenness of that world, all ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have victims. And you would have been victims of that world. So you tell me where the hinge of this world changed. It changed when God himself put on flesh and for the first time began to say in a way that people could hear and understand that every human being has worth and value and every human being is made in the image of God and your worth and value doesn't come because you have some arbitrary outside thing because you're a male you have worth and value or you have finances you're worth and value or you're rich and worth and value or because you're early. no you have worth and value because you're made in the image of God and the Christ followers, those who received him, received that teaching and they began to walk the streets at night and here's all, simply all they did is they picked up girls out of gutters and they picked up boys who, who, whose look wasn't the same look the family wanted and they picked up the disabled and they picked up the orphans and they picked up the discarded and they picked up the poor and they simply took them home and they loved them and why would you do that? Because Christ is light and life. That's the difference Christ has made. The truth is, the truth is that life in every culture is like toys in a toy box. Every culture, the big toys bully the little toys, and the battery-powered toys mock and and dismiss the non-powered ones, and the pink dinosaurs and the monster trucks are angry and crush everything around them. And the Barbie dolls tell the Raggedy Ann's, you're not pretty, you're ugly, and nobody likes you. And the one-armed doll is thrown over in the side. And the toy box has its own story. And the toy box story is always that way until people receive the one from outside the toy box who steps into the toy box and goes, ta-da. And he begins to take the one-armed doll and pull him pull her to himself. And he begins to take those crushed by the monster truck. And he begins to take the monster truck and even heal the anger. And he takes the pink dinosaur and even teaches him how to fly. And a metaphor that I can take as far as I want to is this one. You are the children of a toy box. And the one who stepped in changes everything. I met Mary in South Sudan. I taught for a few weeks in South Sudan, and she was under a tree, and she was doing dental work with a line of people that were coming to her. And they whispered to me and said, you need to know Mary's story. Mary was pretty. She's 22, 23 years old. She was about 15 or 16. One of the rogue armies came through, and they grabbed her. They killed her dad. Her mom ran as a refugee, and Mary was used as a mule to carry their ammunition and to carry their weapons and to be forced to sleep with them at night. And Mary is abused with one of the worst stories you can imagine for the years she's with that army, about three years that she's just in the jungle carrying their stuff. And I meet Mary, and Mary is absolutely vibrant and quiet and sweet and face with a countenance that is redeemed. And you say, Mary, how could all the crap of this world, the worst stuff happen to you, and how are you so good? And her answer is simple. I could either believe what the world said about me and what the world tried to do to me, or I could believe what Jesus sang over me, and I decided Jesus was telling the truth. It was Jesus 
who repaired Mary. I was in India. They took me into a remote place and I opened a barn and they, they, they walked me in this little barn out in the middle of nowhere and, and there's 600 orphans on the ground. They're sleeping on pallets there and their schooling is there and, and you go, where did these 600 kids come from? And they say, it's a, it's a toy box that doesn't care about these people. We went to the city dumps and picked them up. We walked the streets at night and we picked them up and we filled our houses till we, we, we couldn't put them in anymore. And so we got this barn and there's, there's about 12 of us Christian families that all we do is love on these kids and we feed them and we teach them and because they're precious in the sight of God but the world tells them a wrong story. Jesus tells you the truth. I was in Kabul, Afghanistan in 2003. It's a boys' orphanage. It's a boys' orphanage. It has its two little orphanages side by side, two, about 1,200 kids in it. 1,200 boys, by the way, it's boys again because girls don't matter. In these 1,200 boys, there are a total of nine adults. And I lived with three young American college students who took a year to grow their beards in order to go to Afghanistan because one of their brothers had seen the orphanage and he said, these kids, you see, if Allah doesn't want you, then why should anybody else mess with you? If Allah has rejected you and given you that state, why should we intervene? And three Christian College boys spent a year, just all they did is every single day walk in the orphanage and they said, you know the most powerful thing we do? We learn a kid's name. Because when you call a kid by name, he will begin to weep and throw his hands over his head and he will slide down the wall and he will sit and he will weep and shake with the emotion because you're the first adult who called him by name. But I'm not telling old stories out there. I'm actually telling stories here. I don't know you, but I'm not a rookie. Some of you have come in this room, you are so covered with post-it notes. I'm so stupid. I'm I'm not funny, I'm ugly. You've got post-it notes that other people have said stupid things to you. Post-it notes of this, and and there's a desperation that some of you will have. Those post-it notes, it depends on which mood. You have a thousand post-it notes on you. I'm not funny. I'm not this. I would be worth something if, if I were just on the one on the stage, if I had her voice, if I had her talent, if I could just be the one who made a name for myself, I'd be okay. And what you are is you're like kids in a toy box, clawing, trying to become something. And the Jesus, the John, talks to you about for 21 chapters is a Jesus who said oh child child let me tell you the truth about you the world's been lying to you and you've even been lying to yourself you don't even know who you are and John just takes 21 chapters to let me show to show me Jesus as he meets person after person after person And you say, John, you're telling me a crazy story. And John goes, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm telling you the truth. For what it's worth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if I put them together, there's about 96 to 98 places the eyewitnesses will tell you about Jesus. There's about 212 to 215 events they will tell you about Jesus. And they will say, come on, stand here and look. And when you look at Jesus, I mean really look at Jesus, everything changes. There's not time to get into John's gospel very much today, but let me brush across it. John doesn't doll it up. He just tells it. He tells you about the power of Jesus, and he tells you about the heart of Jesus, and he just keeps weaving them together. In John chapter 1, just a simple little story. Philip hangs out with Jesus and is blown away by who Jesus is. And Philip goes and finds a guy named Nathaniel. And he says, Nathaniel, Nathaniel, need to come, come, come. I, I, think, I think we have met the one who is promised from the Old Testament. I think we, this is the Messiah. 
He's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel has the gift of sarcasm. And Nathaniel fires back Nazareth. Nothing good could come from Nazareth. And Philip says, come on, see. Nathaniel comes walking up to Jesus, and it's just a simple story. It's not the biggest one in the world. It's just a simple thing that, that John said, this is what I saw. And as he comes walking up, Jesus says, behold, as he sees Nathaniel, behold an Israelite who's a straight shooter and calls it the way it is. And Nathaniel says, you don't know me. And Jesus said, Nathaniel, when you were still standing under the fig tree before Philip came and talked to you, I knew you. And it begins there. In chapter 2, he simply tells the story. John said, I saw them fill up about 150 gallon worth of water. And it became something different. In John chapter 4, Jesus said he had to go through Samaria. Well, what in the world? You don't have to go through Samaria, but Jesus said he had to go through Samaria. What in the world is that about? So we held our nose and went through Samaria. And we got to this little well at Sychar. And he said, you guys go on. I got something. And a Samaritan woman shows up who has all the post-it notes of every kind imaginable. You're a failure five times with men. And the guy you're living with, I'm sure, is not much of a winner. I'm sure the post-it notes of all kinds were on this woman. And Jesus speaks, ultimately, if I summarize it, he speaks a word of blessing over this woman. Because he knew who she was. And he told the truth. Oh, we could walk through story after story. A nobleman's son, 30 miles away, Jesus speaks the word and, and, the, and, the, and the child doesn't die. And he's made well at that time, 30 miles away. Jesus, who feeds 5,000, with nothing. Jesus who walks on water uh, like, like it's a sidewalk. This Jesus who takes a blind man, blind from birth, and gives him sight. This, this paralyzed lame man who for 38 years, Jesus makes him well. This man who's been buried for four days and decay. His sister cries out, don't take the rock away, decay on the body. No, don't, no, no, no. And Jesus speaks his name and he's healed. And woven through this is this constant sense of come to me. Come to me. Here's what I know as young adults. You're in a toy box. And that toy box has a pretty dark story. I don't care how the toy box tries to position that story. And there's one who steps into the toy box and says, this is the truth. What are you going to do with that, Jesus? In John chapter 1, verse 12, he said, but to all who receive him, he gives the right to become children of God. In John chapter 3, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever. In John chapter 7, if you're thirsty, come to me. John chapter 10, I'm the good shepherd and I care for my sheep. Come. John chapter 15, the branch and the vine. All of those are invitations. John 17, I know you've been at a camp all week. I've been a part of the Christian life a long time. I know you can preach and not know Jesus. I know you can play an instrument and not know Jesus. I know you can be a leader in a youth group and not know Jesus. Oh, you have all that branding. I'm not trying to be obnoxious with this, but there's this conveyor belt. Use your imagination. This conveyor belt. And so you go to VBS as a little kid and you 
learn to play capture the flag in the church auditorium and and, and, and you run around at the church, and, 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 and then you kind of get into junior high, and junior high, you start to get to do mission trips that are kind of local, and you kind of part of the youth group, and, and then you get into high school, and you get to go down to Mexico, or maybe you went to the Caribbean, or, or, or maybe your youth group just did a lot of cool things together, and, 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 you, and you become a leader in the youth group, and, and you're in the youth group, and you're one of the youth group leaders, and, 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 and they actually use you a lot, even in the praise team, and, and, and maybe you, you preach on youth night or something. And everybody says, oh yeah, that's the Christian kid. But you look up, and the story you've been telling yourself is a contradictory story. Yes, I verbalize that Jesus is the center of my life. Yes, I verbalize that, but I'm still living off the post-it notes. I'm still living off the fact of this is what happened, and this is what happened, and this is my life, and, and it'd be, I, I'd be worth something if I could just, if I could just, if I just had a guy who liked me, if I just had a girl who liked me, if I, if I were just funnier, if I were just taller, if I were just better, if I were just picked, if I, if I could just, and you're scrambling, and you're wearing yourself to exhaustion, and Christ is trying to speak a word of blessing to you. He's trying to take all the post-it notes and strip them off and put one note on you, Beloved. 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 All I know to tell you is the story you believe about yourself is either fed by the toy box, and I know what junior high and high school toy boxes are like, they're fed by toy boxes of dads who walked out on you and stepmoms who never really wanted you, perhaps. It's fed by boyfriend, girlfriend, crappy stuff that happens in freshman and sophomore and junior years. I know what that toy box is doing. It has lied and lied and lied and lied. Your million dollar kids who are wearing 10 cent price tags because that's what you've stuck on yourself in the world. And Christ is trying to sing over you and speak blessings. You know, I told you that 212, the 215 events in the scriptures, ultimately they are lepers that Christ spoke words of blessings to. They're Zacchaeus is who he spoke words of blessing to. They're Peter and John, who he spoke words of blessing to. You want to know one of the ironies? Is John himself, apparently, and I don't have any other conclusion, was a hothead who was not a very kind man. The only thing he really kind of, we get, is is he he wants to call down fire from heaven on one, one place because these people aren't treating Jesus right, so let's burn the heck out of them. And later on, When John actually hears the truth himself, John becomes the guy who writes 1 John, which is about love. Here's my question. Have you received Jesus? I mean really received Jesus. Don't don't tell me that cardboard cutout stuff. I, I know that one. Have you let this Jesus peel all the post-it notes off? And have you let him sing his song over you? And have you folded your life into Jesus? That's ultimately the question. Anything else is a miserable Christian existence. To hang on to some Jesus and hang on to your post-it notes won't do you much good. Honestly, that just confuses you and confuses everybody else. So, so what, what are you going to do with Jesus? Jesus will say it to it many times, but come to me. Come. Come. What's coming look like? I, I'm going to summarize it quick and get out of the way. It first means come see. Some of you haven't even spent enough time with Jesus to see him. You know more about lyrics than you know about the Lord of the lyrics. Come see. See, look at Jesus. I think you then have to decide, do I believe Jesus? Because if I believe Jesus, I have to act on that belief. And and, and the post-it notes have got to go away. I, I... I got to let him strip them off of me and I got to believe what he says about me. I think you see, I think you believe, I think repent. Repent is ultimately just simply deciding I I, I don't want to keep living the way I've been living. 
It means turn around. Repent. I, I, I turn. I don't know why baptism is in Scripture. Honestly, I don't. I, I, I just taught. I mean, I know some of the symbolism. It means to, to bury the old me, to have the new me come. I, I know that baptism is there. Simplest story I know about baptism that makes sense to me. It, it, it's, 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 it's an analogy, but, I, but, but you guys are old enough to handle analogies and probably help me with them. It was World War II. Germany had invaded Poland. And they'd conquered Poland. But some of the Polish young men tried to resist. They tried to resist against the Germans. And they were blowing up bridges and trying to fight back against the, the occupying army. And history records that near one small Polish town, the Germans caught five or six young Polish men, resistance fighters, and they... They called the whole town out and made the whole town stand there while they executed them. And when they got done, when they got done, the German officer turned to the crowd and he said, again, in an editorial way, does anybody else want to join him? Anybody want to join him? And the crazy thing was, something happened he didn't expect. An old man stepped out, and an old man said, I'm too old to run with them. I couldn't do what they, what they did. But if you're asking me where my loyalty is, I want my colors clear. Bury me too. I couldn't be there the day that Jesus walked the flesh, in the flesh. I couldn't be there the day Christ was crucified. I couldn't be there the day Christ was resurrected for me. But in baptism, you're saying, but I want my colors clear. Bury me too. Romans chapter 6. Bury me too. I, I identify with Jesus, and he is my life, and I have no other life. It's Christ alone. I want you to see Jesus. I want you to decide if you believe Jesus. I, I want you to decide whether you really want to turn around and follow Jesus. And if you want to follow Jesus, then I, I, I think you say, bury me too. And then he says in John chapter 7, and he'll say in Acts chapter 2 and everywhere else, you're going to live an accompanied life, a partnered life the rest of your life. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I will make you my tabernacle. I will make you my temple. I will make you my dwelling place. And you've got to learn how to live an accompanied life. Anybody's had me in class, I know they've had to do this in class, but give me your hand. Open your hand up. This is the Christian life. It's a partnership with the Holy Spirit. We've raised up enough church mechanics and church technicians. We've raised up enough church preachers. What we haven't raised up enough, enough people who said, Christ, you are my life. I'm done with the post-it notes. I'm folding my life into you. I am yours. Bury me too, and I want to live in a company life with Jesus. That's where John takes us if we had time to do 21 chapters. But you've been here all week, and you've had to wrestle with this. And some of you know what you want to do. Adult leaders, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Adult leaders, I want you down front. Those of you in this room, some of you love Christ and want to just, just need to stay the course. I want you to feel very comfortable to go to some of these people and to say, I love Christ and I've been serving Christ. I want to stay the course. It's not easy. It's really hard. It, things are when light and darkness collide. Things are really hard when heaven and hell have a battleground in your own house. Some of you know you ought not stay the course. Because the way you stay the course right now is confusing you and everybody else. Some of you need to repent. And I need to decide to believe Jesus. I want you to feel free to go to one of these people and say, can we talk or pray? I don't, I don't want you to make a decision 
because anybody else's eyes are here. That'd be stupid. It's called acting. But if you want to talk and pray with somebody about a decision you need to make, I want them available. John wasn't making too much of Jesus. John even says at the end of his book, the world couldn't start to contain all the things I could write about him. The only gift I have to give you is I'm an old guy who Christ changed my life, and I know it's true. Don't squander or waste more time. You decide what you're going to do with Jesus. During this next song, you're welcome to go pray with somebody or go respond. You're welcome to stay where you are as well if that's what you want to do and need to do. But don't you dare treat this passively. Heavenly Father, you are the king of all. And you stepped into our world to give us a complete view of your heart and your power. Lord, I pray that that's exactly what is discovered by this group of students. Would they be disciples of Jesus? In Christ's name, amen.
of your lives praise our God sing holy holy is the Lord go out go be the light of Christ answer the call 
answer the call tonight. Step forward if you need to. Kneel at your seat. Come to the altar. Answer God's call in your life. Let's sing this out. continue to do. Thank you, God, for sending your son, sending yourself in flesh to be what the world needed and to be who you've created us to be. I thank you, God, for your spirit and for all that he will continue to do in our hearts and throughout our lives and through us to other people. God, we love you and we praise you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated in your journal prompt will be on the screen. 